Um, a very well, warm welcome to everyone and also welcome to the new year on the 6th of January. And we hope that the spread of Montessori education may again grow this year and that more children across the world will gain access. And the growth and spread of Montessori is indeed like an indirect theme of this AMI talk. And our small event team is very happy to host all of you. We also thank Faye and Candice who will be admitting people uh, from the waiting room and they will monitor any questions that you leave in the chat. Today's moderator is my colleague Elska Fuhrmans who works in our outreach team. She will introduce the speakers, but before she does, uh, we wanted to highlight this particular date, of course, the 6th of January. And many in the Montessori community will have this so-called knee-jerk reaction and immediately connect the date you know, to the opening of the first Casa dei Bombini. My name is Yoko Verhul, and as I'm part of AMI's legacy team, I'll just give you a bit of brief of history before our speakers delight you. So travel back to that 6th of January, 1907. We find ourselves in Rome, in the poor neighborhood of San Lorenzo. And the 6th of January sees the official opening of an initiative spearheaded by Signor Eduardo Talamo, who has a real estate company that exploits and renovates several tenement blocks in Rome. And he's the one who approaches Maria Montessori and asks her to create an overseer facility, now you would say daycare environment, where the young children of the tenants would be looked after during the day as their parents went out to find work, or as Maria Montessori put it, for the children's fathers were not workmen in regular employment, but casual workers who sought for temporary work from day to day and who therefore could not look after their children, and nearly all were illiterate. Now, this opportunity enabled Maria Montessori to combine her social mission with her unending curiosity into human development taking place in childhood. Later, Maria Montessori would recall that day and, and write that she had a kind of premonition that this day heralded something miraculous. Now, the use of the word miracle is most telling. In the early press coverages of her work, the word miracle is often used to describe how the children develop and what they're capable of. And in fact, Maria Montessori herself was seen as a miracle worker. And that's fine, as long as we realize that the word miracle eventually goes back to the Latin for, for to look, to see. So in the Montessori connection, this must always mean to observe. And yes, with wonder too. The need for miracles never left Maria Montessori. And perhaps you have seen our recent um, December newsletter, where we included the following quote, what is required is a new world full of miracles. Children also seem to work miracles when we realize how eagerly they seek independence and the opportunity to work. And they possess great treasures of enthusiasm and love. A new world for a new human. This is our most urgent need. Today's presentations will share that sense of wonder with you how anywhere in the world, little miracles are waiting to happen. Over to you, Elska. Thank you, Joke. Um, so yeah, after that beautiful introduction, um, after the, the opening of this first Casa dei Bambini, um, Montessori's ideas have spread to, to all corners of the world, as I think most of you know, um, because you're all from all corners of the world. So that <laughs> is proof of this statement. Uh, and as principles of human development, the Montessori principles have also been applied in new and innovative, innovative ways beyond uh, just schools. So now if we look all over the world, we find initiatives that apply Montessori principles in a wide variety of contexts and communities. Uh, today we'll listen to two presentations, uh, the first by Victoria Johnson and the second by Agnese Fontana and Rosario Girolamo. Um, I'm sorry if I don't pronounce that great, because <laughs> I don't really speak Italian. Um, the speakers will present on the global path of Montessori and the application of Montessori principles in a variety of settings uh, and communities. So both presentations will take 30 minutes. 
and uh, we will have 50 minutes for questions afterwards. So if you have questions, please either um, remember them or put them already in the chat and we will make a selection of questions that we can ask uh, the speakers after uh, both uh, presentations have finished. Um, so I would like to now start introducing the first speaker. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce her to you, Victoria Johnson. Uh, Victoria is a postdoctoral research associate at the University of Nebraska, Link uh, Nebraska Lincoln, where she coordinates research, evaluation, and implementation of the responsive equitable system for preparing early childhood teachers across Nebraska project. Uh, she's passionate about Montessori and community-based uh, cultural relevant education and about pursuing creative solutions for education that addresses holistic uh, de de developmental growth among underserved populations. Um, Victoria got actively involved with Educateur Sans Frontières uh, through her latest research and I am very grateful that she did. Um, so today, Victoria will share some insights from her uh, most recent research, which is focused on the diverse application of Montessori education and its potential in addressing societal and developmental needs of children and communities. Um, so Victoria, over to you and thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction and the invitation to speak today. I am so excited to share this presentation. I want to begin by expressing my sincere gratitude for ESF. Uh, when I found Educateur Sans Frontier, it was like finding an international family that I didn't know I had. And I am deeply indebted to the individuals who participated in my research, many of whom are part of this community. Without their participation and support, I wouldn't have the insight that I am about to share today. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. So uh, before I dive into the topic, I wanna give a bit of background on myself. My research is qualitative and as such, the researcher is the instrument of data collection and interpretation. So it is important for you to know a bit more about me to understand the lens that I bring to the questions I've asked and the work that I've done. I can only give a small slice of the life experiences that influence my work and research. But you should know a few important things. When I was growing up, my early formal education transitioned into a very informal, self-driven in education when my family moved to a remote area when I was eight years old. This experience taught me in a profound way that education does not happen necessarily between the walls of a classroom. It is inherently a part of who we are. It is also It also gave me a much broader perspective of what an education environment can look like and a critical perspective on what an optimal education might be. When I discovered Montessori, I had already earned two degrees studying both human development and education. And I was keenly interested in the way that these are inseparably connected. I was so impressed with Montessori education that I completed Montessori training for ages three through 12 before pursuing another graduate degree focused on human development and global education. So the lens that I bring to my research is certainly partial toward Montessori, but it also takes a broad view of education in general and its purpose in the pathways of human development. I also come to this work from the perspective of a parent. My four children have also had very diverse education experiences, and they have both thrived and struggled in Montessori environments. So the questions that I bring to my research and that lay the foundation for what I share today are deeply rooted in both the theoretical questions of my academic training and the perspective of my personal experience. So let's dive in and look at diversity, adaptability, and universality of Montessori around the world. Let's see if this will go, okay. The best way to introduce this topic is to use an analogy from nature. We can be easily misled from understanding any phenomenon if we are too close or too far from it. So I want to present the perspectives of diversity in Montessori environments from both a forest and a tree perspective. In other words, we want to look at it from the broad spectrum of Montessori around the world and its place within global education, 
as well as the more detailed aspects of unique and diverse Montessori environments. As we know, a forest is made up of diverse species and organisms that support and sustain one another in a beautiful ecology. Similarly, I have found that among the diverse settings and application of Montessori philosophy and practices around the world, we can find unique sources of strengths and similar challenges in local contexts, as well as important commonalities that quietly weave them all together in a beautifully diverse and global whole. Importantly, I hope that what I share today will illustrate what I've observed to be an under-recognized network of individuals and communities bound together in a common social mission to improve humanity and the developmental experiences of children through Montessori principles. If we look at the tree perspective, however, we also see that each learning environment is as unique as the individuals who make up its community, the guides, teachers, families, and especially the children who participate in it. Their community values, home culture, local language, and history all intertwine to influence both the pedagogy that they create and the desired outcomes that they are pursuing. Although we want everyone to have an equal access to quality education, when we narrow in on the individual lives and circumstances of children all over the world, we quickly see that giving children the same kind of education is impossible and I would argue ineffective. I'm sorry, this is giving me a hard time with transitioning. Okay, I wanna start by going back to the forest perspective and in looking at global education in general. I'll do that by giving a brief overview of the real circumstances that spurred my interest in this research in the first place. Opportunities for positive educational experiences for children in the margins is something that matters a great deal to me. Current global statistics demonstrate that while access to education has improved drastically since 1970, progress in the last 20 years has essentially halted. In fact, due to ongoing displacement and the COVID-19 pandemic, we've actually moved backwards where the number of children not attending school is increasing around the world. These estimates indicate that over 64 million children are not attending primary school, which includes children up to 12 years. Now, it's important to point out here that education and schooling are not necessarily the same thing. For some children, their education will occur through accumulating knowledge that is passed down through family and community interactions and used to sustain ways of life that have occurred over generations of time. However, we know that particularly in the global knowledge of the economy of today, formal and expanded education is important for protecting human rights, developing sustainable practices for personal and community well-being, and designing innovative solutions that protect natural environments and promote worldwide peace. Based on the research concerning global education, I believe that closing this gap is an issue of accessibility and adaptability that these are the most difficult children to reach due to location, unique needs, and circumstances. And this problem is not going away. In fact, depending on how the statistics are calculated, estimates of children and adolescents missing out on education may be well over 200 million. Some projections estimate that by the year 2030, more than half of the world's children will reside in countries that have the lowest access to education. This situation is further challenged by ongoing displacement resulting from war, conflict, climate change, and other threats to safety and livelihoods. In fact, since I began this research in 2019, the number of displaced persons has increased by over 30 million individuals, half of which are children, and many of whom will spend their childhood in exile without access to formal education. To provide better education opportunities and support the developmental needs of children in these circumstances, I believe we need to take a strengths-based approach and look at the capacity and potential of individuals and communities who can address these needs through adaptable and informal solutions for education instead of relying on Western-based traditional brick and mortar schools. When I discovered Montessori education, I was intrigued by its strong partnership with both development and education theory. As I studied current challenges and global education needs, I could see that Montessori has tremendous potential to uniquely meet these needs due to its flexible environments, material-based curriculum, emphasis on community, child-centered learning, and potential for adjustments to context. 
However, Montessori education in general has been historically underrepresented in the research literature and evidence of its application in diverse or informal settings is extremely sparse. So it became clear that there's a lot of ground to cover here. That brings us to this research study that I am presenting about today. I was interested in better understanding what Montessori really is in practice and whether it could offer adaptable solutions to close the education gap for children in vulnerable circumstances. This necessitated a serious look at how Montessori education is applied in diverse environments around the world. So my study of both the challenges of global education and Montessori education led me to see the immense potential in those environments to meet global education needs. But the research in Montessori education is primarily focused on brick and mortar school buildings and actually often perceives diversity of application as a threat to the, to the integrity of Montessori, not as a strength. So this challenge, that is the lack of research on the diversity in Montessori, the cultural relevance and application of Montessori, and making sense of the tensions between the need to adapt while maintaining authenticity were areas that I really wanted to explore further in diverse international environments. This was a long journey of discovery, and so I just want to give you a little glimpse of the methods that I use because that is important too. Much of our scientific research in education follows the traditional path of beginning with a hypothesis that is based on theory and then using the research to test that hypothesis. However, I found this approach to be inadequate for the questions at hand. I found that we really didn't know enough about diversity in Montessori environments to begin making hypotheses. I observe that we have much to learn from individuals and communities who are using Montessori around the world before we can make assumptions about what is really important. And so I used a specific research approach that focuses on learning from the everyday experiences of individuals and developing a theory from the ground up. This is important because it gives each person's perspective an equal place at the table. So in this method of research, each participant is considered an expert. By comparing and contrasting experiences, I was then able to understand both commonalities and differences, which helps us to understand both the forest and the tree's perspective. So my study began when I carefully observed three similar Montessori environments in the United States. Although their populations of children were very similar, they existed in the same general region and they received training from similar sources. In, um, each one was culturally unique. As I observed the environments and made comparisons, I noticed that even though they were all drawing from the same Montessori principles and practices, these principles and practices seem to fluidly adapt to the overarching culture or emphasis that each environment valued, while demonstrating similar developmental growth among their children. So in other words, I found that the principles and practices seem to function like the trunk of the tree with its roots drawing from Montessori philosophy and instruction, but the way the tree bloomed and flowered was reflective of its unique community. Ultimately, the participants for this study were previously or currently involved in 26 different Montessori environments in 17 different locations around the world, including the Canadian Arctic, as well as Ontario, Canada, multiple locations in the United States, Mexico, Colombia, Paraguay, Denmark and Austria and Europe, Ghana, Kenya, and Zimbabwe in Africa, and Lebanon, Afghanistan, Thailand, and Japan. In addition to diversity in geographical location and context, the participants played multiple and varied roles in the environments they were involved with, including teachers or guides, administrators, advocates and leaders, practitioners and other non-Montessori educative and developmental centers, parents, and volunteers. So to address the research question, I sought to understand the context in which Montessori was implied was applied. So the where, where was Montessori being um, taking place? The purposes or reasons that initiated these applications or the why for those initiatives, and then the processes that were involved in implementation or the how. So let's talk about findings. Uh, starting with the where, the diversity of Montessori environments was so vast that I found myself going back to the beginning several times in this project to define what a Montessori setting looks like. What I found was that Montessori was applied in both conventional and non-conventional contexts, meaning individuals and communities found ways to use Montessori principles and practices 
to address important needs in all kinds of settings and environments. Conventional examples include those that we would typically expect, such as schools and caregiving centers. Um, but the non-conventional examples seem to include an endless array of opportunities from tutoring, volunteering, emergency situations, uh, prisons, parent-child groups, after-school clubs, organizing administrative staff, and so on. And these varied applications ranged from micro or individual levels to macro or organizational levels. So we can see that a little more clearly here in this figure um, where we see the vast diversity from individual applications down to the organization, um, organizational institutions. So this ranged from one-on-one -on -one tutoring on the individual level to applying the same principles in administration and advocacy at the organization level. For instance, even in ways that we typically think of Montessori application in a learning environment, for instance, uh, we see that there's tremendous variability in the types of environments and settings where these principles and practices can guide children in their learning and development. In mobile settings, for example, among nomadic tribes, in a community school with an internally displaced persons camp, in an orphanage, a homeless shelter, or a prison setting. Although these settings are vastly different in culture, context, and geography, they shared commonalities in the ways that they used Montessori principles and practices. For example, a father in Colombia and a mother in Paraguay found ways to apply Montessori principles to support their children during COVID by creating their own Montessori materials using what they had available, preparing the home environment, and engaging intentionally in the spiritual preparation of the adult. Other principles and practices, such as grace and courtesy, observation, the prepared environment, planes of development, human tendencies, control of error, concrete materials, mixed age classrooms, and following the child were commonly used in these diverse settings to support the learning and development of children within their unique cultural and geographical contexts. So next I explore the why or the reasons and purposes for initiating a Montessori environment. In each circumstance, Montessori was implemented to address a need, which fell into one of three categories, local, developmental, or societal. Local needs were varied, but they were driven by the unique circumstances of that local community. Examples include an orphanage, indigenous language preservation, help with presenting curriculum and various education concepts, childcare for refugee parents, and early childhood education in remote locations. Developmental needs were driven by a motivation to find a better way to meet the holistic needs of children and youth in physical, social, emotional, and cognitive ways. These individuals were passionate about serving children by meeting them where they were at and preparing them for life. Similarly, societal needs were focused on promoting higher ideals among humanity in general, such as environmental sustainability, world peace, and stronger economic stability. Um, so I'll share some quick examples, but just so you know, all names have been changed, they're pseudonyms. Um, but for instance, in Japan, Himari started an after-school Montessori elementary club due to the limited opportunities in her local city um, that children had to build their own community and pursue community projects outside of the classroom. So that's a local example. Um, for developmental, Aina, a preschool guide in Afghanistan, explained that Montessori education was important for children in her community because it went beyond academics to address the deeper needs for development. And Callista in Lebanon felt that improving economic circumstances and ensuring well-being in her country uh, depended on an education that taught children their capacity and responsibility to make a difference in their social world. So in this next part, when we look at the question of how Montessori principles and practices were applied to create and sustain these diverse environments, we can better understand both the unique areas of adaptation as well as some of the common struggles and challenges that Montessori environments share. Here, I will do my best to briefly explain the processes of implementing Montessori across these varied environments. So initially, we start here at this paradigm aspect or phase. This captures the varied perspectives that individuals and communities have when they apply Montessori philosophy, principles, practices, and methods to create an environment that's going to support learning and development. In this initial stage, there is a lot of variability. 
Some persons focus more on the methods or materials that Montessori has to offer, using them as a tool to support a learning environment, whereas others view those principles and practices uh, or view principles and practices as a way to support the values and goals that they are already pursuing. At the highest end of the spectrum, Montessori philosophy is embraced as a worldview and applied not only in formal learning environments, but in everyday interactions and in their general perceptions of the world. This, continu this continuum is important for a few reasons. First, it helps us to understand the degree to which Montessori principles and practices are applied throughout the rest of this process, um, this entire implementation process. But secondly, it is ever changing. What I found to be prominent in this research was that although a person or a community may apply Montessori philosophy, say at the lowest level, uh, such as just using materials to support their traditional curriculum, uh, for example, the application of principles and practices increased through the ongoing process of implementation. And their perspective actually tended to move up higher along the continuum over time. This perspective combined with the local, developmental, and societal needs that were being addressed, as we see here, as those needs both shaped and were influenced by the paradigm perspective. In the implementation phase, this one in the center, we see some important com commonalities across the sites. So first, building a support network was critical to the growth and sustainability of any setting or environment. These support networks included parents and families, as well as staff but also extended to community leaders, mentors, and teacher trainers. Importantly, although the environments were generally designed to serve children, having an invested interest from the children was just as important as having it from anyone else. In taking care of logistics, each setting had to address various needs, such as aligning with government regulations, finding a suitable location, acquiring necessary funds, hiring staff members, enrolling families, and managing other local and general challenges. This process was directly influenced by Montessori principles and practices, which informed how the environment needed to be structured and supported. In this area, individuals and communities drew on their local strengths, but often faced impeding challenges. Sometimes the setting was able to handle these challenges by finding unique and creative solutions to make it work. At other times, however, it was necessary to compromise some of the principles and practices of Montessori in order to keep their setting from dissolving altogether. Here we see one of the most important areas of interest in the process of implementation, adapting the Montessori environment to their local context. Generally, there were two reasons for adapting principles, practices, and methods. First, these adaptations helped to create environments that mirrored the socio-cultural expectations of the children's local and natural environment. And second, adaptations were made in order to enhance or reinforce local cultural practices. These adaptations were made at three different levels. The level of the child, where materials, the prepared environment, and principles and practices were tailored to support the individual needs of children with diverse needs. At the setting level, these same aspects were adapted to reflect or support the unique vision or mission of that particular setting or environment. And at the broader community level, materials, the environment, and principles and practices were adapted in order to reflect the local culture of the community. So here are some visual examples that participants shared of the ways that they adapt Montessori and make it work for their local context. Here we see language materials that have been designed specifically to teach indigenous language by constructing Montessori materials in the syllabics of the Inuktitut language. The middle photo shows a participant's son helping to prepare language materials that she created herself in order to teach her children at home during the COVID-19 pandemic. And up in the corner, we see how a preschool in Afghanistan found innovative ways to repair math materials that are all but impossible to acquire in their local area. And then down in the far right corner, we see uh, where father created materials for his young son out of resources that he had on, um, on hand at home. The processes of adaptation to local context took place in the environment, in the materials that were used, and in the ways that Montessori philosophy and practice were applied. So here are some examples from the environment perspective. 
uh, using what is available, such as a coat closet, a rented room, a mobile tent, a community center, or home. Bringing a community elder into the environment to emphasize cultural activities and native language. Beautifying the environment with clothing, wall designs, local and cultural craftsmanship. Creating a mobile classroom to move with nomadic tribes. Uh, spending that three hour work cycle in outdoor environments, including bilingual staff. And expanding Montessori access by putting those environments in community spaces. Materials were also adapted in various ways, such as using rocks, sticks, beans, or seeds from locally available resources in order to make their own materials, or relying on local craftsmen to create concrete materials. Uh, manufacturing the movable alphabet, sandpaper letters, nomenclature cards in native languages, acquiring the, or altering the nomenclature cards to reflect the children's natural environment, and creating practical life materials that reflected the day-to-day -day work of their cultural community. Although this was less common, philosophy and practice were sometimes adapted to meet the unique needs of children or the local circumstances. For instance, it may be presenting materials right to left instead of left to right to reflect local linguistic and reading patterns, providing materials and instruction in multiple languages, helping children from non-monastery backgrounds to transition to autonomous learning, using dolls to reinstate cultural identity and help children recover from trauma, applying practices from other developmental sources to meet diverse needs of children or altering presentations and the use of materials to teach concepts in different ways, or applying going out principles in alternate ways to promote autonomy through some unique contexts. So finally, I want to draw your attention to the recalibration phase, this stage at the end. In this phase of implementation, striving for authenticity in applying Montessori philosophy brought on unique challenges. In recalibrating, there were sometimes necessary changes due to conflicting sociocultural expectations. For example, some Montessori principles were in direct contrast to local values or goals of families. Similarly, when practitioners wanted to increase the integrity of how Montessori principles were applied, they often encountered obstacles such as not having access to training, resources, or information. The more authentically they attempted to integrate Montessori principles, practices, and methods, the more challenging each, the more challenges each setting seemed to encounter. These challenges, however, were often offset by the positive outcomes that they saw taking place. Important in this phase of implementation was the role it played in sending participants back to their perspective or paradigm view of Montessori, improving their practice and implementation, implementation in a continual ongoing process. So that ongoing process continually strengthened the growth of both individuals and the community as a whole. As they worked through challenges and adapted Montessori principles to meet their contextual needs, the overarching application of Montessori philosophy, that is revealing and supporting the inner and unique potential of each child, increased over time, and they implemented those supporting principles more and more. This brings me to a final point that I want to highlight. The tension that exists in the broader Montessori community has often revolved around the balance between adapting to meet the needs of students and communities where they are at and the integrity of the method or applying Montessori principles in the ideal way with the highest level of authenticity. This was something I observed in my own experience, but it also emerged as a prevalent concern in the research process. If we return to the model here and look at the continuum of perspectives or this paradigm at the beginning of the process, Highlighting this aspect can help us make sense of the broad diversity that exists across these environments. When we move the continuum to a horizontal axis, we can make sense of it from another perspective. This model represents the way that the theoretical foundations of human development that are embedded in Montessori are expressed through three strands, philosophy, methodology, and the practices that link the two together. Each strand was applied differently according to the training, cultural needs, goals, and mission, practitioner knowledge, and practical feasibility of each contextual environment. This helps us understand the vast differences and interpretations of what Montessori is. 
In other words, it is not possible to adequately understand Montessori from a single or even multiple Montessori settings. So why, why does this matter? Um, in my mind, this is perhaps the most important finding of all because it reveals the validity in both diversity and adaptability or both diversity or adaptability and striving for authenticity or integrity. In this model, I believe every setting has both a valid place of residence as well as infinite opportunity for growth. Here, I think we can find important opportunities to bridge divides and chasms, finding strength in the forest of global diversity. What I found was that whatever aspect was adopted by a setting led to its continued growth along the continuum, strengthening its application of Montessori philosophy overall. So ultimately, the most important takeaway from this is that evidence for the universality or universal application of Montessori is demonstrated through its potential in diversity. If we believe that Montessori is for every child in every geographical location, every context, every culture, and every community, and we recognize the vast global diversity that exists across humankind, then it only makes sense that diversity is something to be celebrated as an indication of the universal application Montessori has to offer. This is so important, I wanna emphasize it again. The most important outcome of this research study, I believe, is that the universal potential or universality of Montessori is demonstrated by its vast adaptability to diverse cultures, community, and geographical settings around the world. My hope is that as we navigate and observe the diversity expressed by Montessori settings around the world, that we will celebrate the beauty of that diversity, the ecological strength it lends to the overarching improvement of all Montessori environments, and the incredible potential to reach children in places and circumstances in profound ways, offering opportunities and hope to children all over the world. Thank you all so much for your time um, and with deep gratitude to my participants in Educateurs Sans Frontières. I invite anyone interested to email me if they um, want access to publications, if you have anything to add to this, or if you want to participate in ongoing research. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Victoria, for this uh, beautiful presentation. It was, I think it was super inspiring. And um, yeah, thanks a lot. If anyone has questions for Victoria also now, please put them in the chat because we will get back to them uh, after our second presentation. Um, so uh, now I would like to introduce to you uh, the speakers of the second presentation, um, Agnese Fontana and Rosario Di Girolamo. <laughs> um, <laughs> so Agnese is a producer and an author. She graduated from the Centro Sperimentale di Cine Cinematografia. <laughs> Uh, and has produced films in competitions at uh, major international festivals, uh, such as in Venice, Locarno, Ber Berlin, Seattle, uh, and Sundance. Uh, since 2011, she is the CEO and founder of Letali, uh, an independent production company, which mainly produces art house uh, films and documentaries. She produced, among others, uh, Caesar Must Die, by the Tiviani brothers, uh, which was a winner of the 2012 Berlina Golden Bear, and Red Sky at Night, a uh, winner of the Biograph Film 2022 uh, Audience Award and the UCA Award. Um, in uh, 2020, um, together with Maurizio Schiara, she started the Montessori Road Project. Um, which was the starting point for the production of the documentary Help Me Do It Myself, um, the Montessori idea, uh, which focuses on the Montessori movement in, in different cultures. Um, so for today's talk, uh, Agnese will be joined uh, by her partner Rosario, who is a cross-media creative director and producer. Um, he's responsible for creating the Montessori Road website and uh, integrating it with all the social media channels. 
Uh, Rosario built up many years of experience in IT, marketing, and communications uh, before he joined the Letali production company. So today, Anisa and uh, Rosario will share their experience with um, the Montessori Road project mm -hmm. and also show some visual materials to, to, to illustrate their story. Um, Agnes and Rosario, thank you so much for being here. And um, yeah, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm Agnes and, and I'm Rosario. <laughs> You know, Rosario is also a female name in some languages, so we, <laughs> we clarify in a way. Uh, so first of all, uh, thank you for inviting us. Uh, it's really a pleasure and an honor for us to be here to speak uh, to all of you. Uh, thanks for introducing us. Uh, and uh, I, I'd like to share with you is related uh, um, of today, that is the 6th of January, um, talking about the reopening of the first Casa dei Bambini in San Lorenzo, in Rome, because it was uh, closed for uh, uh, a lot of time. Uh, and uh, uh, that uh, was, uh, the story was for us very, very touching. Siamo entrati nella casa dei bambini e questo era un po' il primo effetto che entrando qui si riceveva, quello proprio di entrare in una casa alla dimensione dei bambini e quindi tutti gli oggetti sono stati appunto pensati proprio perché i bambini li potessero utilizzare e fossero alla loro altezza e questa fu la sensazione che ebbe un'amica della dottoressa Montessori quando entrò qui e da lei viene l'origine del nome Casa dei Bambini, perché disse Maria, ma tu hai fatto una casa per i bambini, no? L'adulto era immediatamente, aveva la percezione di essere sproporzionato rispetto all'organizzazione dell'ambiente. I can remember walking in and thinking, oh, right, it's just, it was just an apartment. It was nothing like a school, it was just an apartment. There was a lovely garden. There were still some pieces of material that were in the original Casa dei Bambini, still on the shelf. Um, and I, I, I had a kind of a, a reaction of, oh my goodness, here, I'm here in this place. Purtroppo la Casa dei Bambini di San Lorenzo subì, come tutte le scuole Montessori in Italia, la chiusura nel 1934 per intervento di Mussolini. E quindi questo ambiente, questa prima casa dei bambini, rimane chiusa per più di 30 anni. Finalmente nel 1966, un'allieva della dottoressa Montessori, Maria Clotilde Pini, sognò di poter riaprire la casa dei bambini di Via dei Marsi. San Lorenzo, 1907, un quartiere malfamato dove si diceva che si passava tranquilli solo dopo morti perché vicino c'è il cimitero monumentale e a questo punto io decisi che Via dei Marsi bisognava riaprirla. Ora, riaprire Via dei Marsi era già per me una grande vittoria sentimentale. Decise di riaprire questa scuola il 6 gennaio per rispettare la data che la dottoressa Montessori aveva appunto utilizzato. Molto preoccupata perché in quel momento i bambini sono già a scuola, quindi la sua preoccupazione era come avvicinare i bambini a questa scuola. E mentre era proprio in quell'ambiente, seduta con la maestra e la custode, sentì suonare alla porta. Io vado ad aprire e mi trovo davanti una bambinetta 5 anni. Allora io la guardo e gli dico, buongiorno, e tu da dove vieni? Vengo dal piano di sopra, perché sopra ci sono gli appartamenti, abitati da, da famiglie. Ah, e sei scesa da sola? Sì. Come ti chiami? Mi chiamo Maria. Allora, io sarò pure quella dei segni, sarò pure quella che crede in certi segnali, però questa cosa mi ha fatto molto effetto. La prima bambina che è tornata via dei marsi, Dopo 40 anni si chiamava Maria. Un 
and uh, our complete team include the multi-awarded director, Maurizio Sciarra, that you mentioned a few minutes ago. Uh, that is uh, last but not least a Montessori parent. So we, you can see uh, the three of us. And um, the, our Montessori adventure takes place over four years of work to arrive at the beginning of the fifth on 2023. Let's go tell this story in three different parts, chronologically, focus on the mission and with some videos. Our topic is uh, from a one-off documentary to permanent archive and cross media, the challenges of, of the challenge of languages and creation of value for the Montessori communities. We start uh, on uh, um, 19th and uh, when the, Maurizio comes to us uh, with, the, with an idea of a documentary focus uh, on the Matilde, uh, Maria Clotilde Pini experience uh, in Rome, China. Um, she was uh, one of the last uh, uh, direct pupils of Maria Montessori. Um, our goal uh, was to have the documentary ready um, for the uh, Montessori celebration uh, on 2020 for the anniversary. Um, we therefore start with the patronage of the um, Opera Nazionale Montessori to welcome immediately the prestigious Cinecittà on board as a partner right from the development phases, not best, as you know, uh, being Italian. So, um, in June, uh, we start uh, with the first shooting uh, in some uh, Montessori school uh, in Rome. And then Master Pini, Master Pini passed away and the pandemic show up. Uh, it completely upset our plan. But the only positive news uh, we got when uh, the, the Italian Ministry of Culture launched uh, um, a call for a cultural special project. Uh, and it was the first time in October 2020. On February 2021, uh, we won the contest uh, and I'm thrilled just to remember the moment, you know, it was really uh, a great, uh, turning point for us. And uh, we start uh, shooting on March uh, on the, um, on the mind uh, um, Italian state, uh, uh, telling how they conceive uh, uh, the uh, two euros uh, um, coins uh, dedicated to the anniversary. And then uh, in July, we start with the Montessori Road Cross Media that Rosario will tell deeply uh, later. Um, I just want to go uh, on chronological um, way. And then in July, we establish our uh, first mission abroad in Albania, and we uh, shoot on the Montessori school uh, in Tirana, it, it, it's the Casa dei Bambini, and was uh, our first uh, experience shooting with child on that ways and was very, very interesting and surprising for us uh, how it works. And then mm -hmm. in October, we uh, did the very first presentation uh, uh, of Montessori Road uh, connected to the uh, Opera Nazionale Montessori International Congress uh, in, in October, as I said. And then in November, we uh, um, participate and shoot, of course, uh, um, on the naming ceremony of the uh, Roma School in the name of Maria Clotilde Pini. 
and that was a very touching uh, moment uh, because all the Roman communities uh, was uh, around this uh, um, this moment, uh, and, and we uh, also did the online uh, um, event. And then uh, finally. In, no in November, we uh, visited the Netherlands. Uh, so this mission was uh, um, very special for us because uh, uh, we, we met uh, the army uh, organization. We, we established the uh, relationship with uh, Carolina Montessori and all the army staff. Uh, and uh, we should... Uh, uh, on the um, Casa Bilingual Montessori School, uh, Pinacker, if I said in the right way the name of the place. And, um, and uh, Carolina introduced us uh, the idea uh, to go uh, to Chiaravalle Museum for, for the inauguration of uh, the, 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 the museum in, in December. And again, uh, she uh, opened us, op op open us uh, our mind to look at the Montessori for Kenya project. So we start thinking on that uh, too. In January 22, we, uh, um, we shoot uh, um, some uh, uh, experience with uh, a former alumni and uh, one of the brilliant uh, in Italy is Ugo Zampetti, that is the general secretary of the Italian uh, Republic at the Quirinale. So he's very close to our president. And uh, he did a kind of uh, uh, testimony and an interview very, very interesting. And then in March, uh, uh, was the turn to go in uh, Perugia, Santa Croce, to shooting uh, an interview with uh, Erika Moretti, uh, that is a Montessori history scholar, and uh, Matteo Ferroni, that is an architect and uh, mon former Montessori alumno. Uh, also, this experience was uh, very interesting uh, related to all the uh, wonderful group in, in uh, Perugia, Santa Croce. And then uh, something happens again uh, to, to give us another turning point uh, because we, uh, we came on board Rai Documentari that uh, uh, work with us uh, and support us to produce the one-off documentary we started on the beginning but that becomes not just focus on a specific moment and, and characters, but more focus on the uh, Montessori method uh, uh, spread all over the world, comparing situation in, in a different country and culture. So in uh, April, we, we shoot in, uh, in Gonzaga, Faedo, uh, a moment focus on the Montessori material. And then again, on the uh, Roma uh, school uh, de named, dedicated to Maria Clotilde Pini. And finally, in May, we did the Kenya mission at the corner of Hope uh, with the collaboration of the uh, Italian Institute of Culture, the corner of Hope, and the Montessori for Kenya. In every of our mission abroad, we had the participation of the Italian Institute of Culture and uh, the embassy that support us. Um, so finally, in October, we, we complete the documentary that was on air in October and immediately after, on demand in Rai Play, that means the Italian bro official bro national broadcaster. So in a way, we did our goal and we arrive uh, on, on the photo finish. Before uh, the product uh, uh, was a simple documentary <coughs> uh, positioned on a broadcast channel or uh, an OTT. After, 
uh, our change uh, um, the uh, need and the possibility to go to the community and film um, um, directly with the possibility to uh, produce a, a content immediately uh, made us the chance to have a website structured of, uh, as a, a showcase of a video content. Um, the other part of, uh, of uh, um, uh, our product was uh, an uh, unexpected in some way uh, part because considering that the audience is now directly the uh, Montessorian community, uh, we started to uh, archive and structure contents, that means video and interview, uh, with uh, uh, a um, specific uh, approach. Uh, our idea was immediately to um, put in a special uh, section of the, web, uh, of the website and uh, give access to the community of scholars, teachers, uh, academics. Um, the second turning point was uh, um, the um, Red documentary that uh, at the uh, at March of 22 um, engaged us uh, and gave us the, the chance to uh, finish also the initial idea of documentary, uh, even if uh, in two years the content of the documentary was completely changed. Uh, and 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 I like to share uh, uh, with you um, something very touch myself uh, uh, during the shooting, uh, the crew experience with children was uh, very um, surprising me because as a producer, I was really afraid when the Maurizio, the director comes to, uh, 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 to propose us uh, to shooting with children. Everyone in the, in the movie business knows shooting children is very difficult. They do what they want, they don't follow you, and, and, and all of this kind of problem during the shooting. And we discover in the Montessori school, they was concentrated in their work. So we do whatever we need without any. That was the example in Netherlands or in Albania in which they was uh, curious, like uh, are doing a kind of new work, a new experience. So they want to uh, share with us uh, our technical stuff, uh, uh, having a lot of curiosity and, and question to present us. And finally, in a minute, they become uh, uh, supporting with the director and the camera operator. As you can see, they watch uh, on the camera, they control, they understand everything. So uh, uh, what was uh, my biggest worry was completely uh, disappear <laughs> during the experience, telling me, uh, make me touching by hand uh, what is uh, the power the Montessori method in the, in the school. Um, another thing uh, that was uh, uh, really interesting for us uh, having this experience uh, was uh, to uh, uh, watch the difference and similarity of uh, children at work uh, in the Montessori environment in country that uh, have a different uh, uh, background. Just for example, the silent game, uh, and, 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 and I show you some uh, videos, uh, a la, a la, uh, a short content about that. Uh, please, can you confirm that we hear the audio? When I put the board like this, I mean to be silent, okay? Just 
gioco del silenzio è nato proprio qui a via dei marzi ma per un episodio assolutamente fortuito perché mentre i bambini entravano in classe la dottoressa montessori era proprio qui in questa sala e una delle mamme aveva in braccio un piccolo neonato un bambino e alla dottoressa montessori venne spontaneo prendere questo bambino in braccio sedersi qui nella sala e aspettare che tutti i bambini piano piano si accorgessero e di questa nuova presenza e piano piano si creò un vero silenzio spontaneo nei bambini e, e quello che accadde è che appunto lei li invitò a cercare di sentire addirittura il lieve rumore del respiro di questo bambino. Many people say it's a meditative experience, but it is a, an experience that grounds children. It is, it is not used to quiet children, but it requires a child to be aware of their own noise and silence it. It's beautiful to see. Vuole per chiudere gli occhi, iniziamo ad ascoltare e a riconoscere i rumori che vengono da fuori. Il gioco del silenzio è sicuramente un esercizio collettivo perché se io da solo mantengo l'alto controllo e non faccio rumore comunque non basto perché ogni singolo bambino contribuisce alla costruzione possiamo dire del silenzio facciamo un giro così qualche bambino ci dice qualche rumore che ha riconosciuto mentre stava in silenzio le zampe del cagnolino e poi... Le zampe di un cagnolino? Sì, che... E poi... Anche tu le sentite? E poi la moto. La? La moto. La moto. What have you had? Cow. Ok. Good. And you? What have you had? A walk. So, after this adventure, and you can see still work in progress, We are editing all the interview we collect in the different mission and also all the observational material we shoot in the class focus on different uh, moment in the teaching following the method. Uh, so um, the director has the idea to put the camera every time on the same level of children. So you can see exactly what it happens. Uh, and uh, in uh, following the uh, Montessori philosophy, not uh, having uh, children look uh, behind uh, or back, but just in front and uh, on the same level. That's uh, give us possibility to collect a lot of uh, Um, documentation about the method, how it works, uh, the work with uh, the Montessori uh, object uh, and uh, uh, ordinary life in teaching. So finally, after uh, um, realize the, um, the goal uh, with the documentary uh, one-off of uh, around 50 minutes, uh, Um, in a way, we still going back and forth with the idea to develop a doc series of four, maybe six episodes uh, in which we uh, want to expanding all over the world the story of the actuality of the method, the method included, including also other topics. Uh, following uh, the actual schema we already did, our format, I mean, improving the collaboration with Amin and the Outreach team of the Educateurs Sans Frontières, uh, that we have to, uh, to thank also for the supporting during the mission in Kenya, uh, Francesca and, uh, and the sister, uh, and was uh, 
and Sister Veronica, there was a, a very, very supporting us, opening us this uh, uh, wonderful world uh, that we discover on that way. So in, the, in developing uh, the documentary series, uh, we understood uh, uh, we need to tell the Montessori's life uh, and thought, going back and forth between life, ideas, and the world of today in the Montessori world, I mean. Using also uh, from the technical and the narrative point of view, uh, fiction reconstruction, archive materials, uh, and uh, graphic novelization close to the documentary as we did before. Uh, now we come back in development phases, look for uh, a production partner, and, and I mean uh, companies like we are uh, coming from uh, uh, around the world, uh, from the different country we want to show. It. Of course, uh, uh, choosing the right country, the right experience to tell will be uh, very um, uh, uh, challenging. We already established from the production point of view uh, some relationship in, uh, in South Africa, in, um, Argentina. in Argentina, in Ecuador, in, Ecuador uh, in Israel, and we are on the very first step uh, on this way. Of course, we, uh, um, we must have uh, the North America, uh, the USA and, uh, and Canada, uh, India and all the Asia, of course, uh, uh, and we're still hoping China, why not? <laughs> <laughs> it sounds uh, like impossible, but you know, that's the challenge every time. And um, uh, every, every support, every suggestion, of course, uh, uh, will be very welcome. So uh, we we became a bit late. Um, I'm sorry, but we really want to share uh, something with all of you. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. I think the clips were super beautiful. Very much appreciated. Also, if I look in the in the chat. Thank you. Thank you so much. Fantastic. <laughs> So um, I think we, we ran a little bit out of time for questions. So what I would like to suggest is that anyone who would have questions can um, either contact the speakers um, or contact us on info uh, at montessori-esf.org. Um, and then we can forward the questions uh, to the speakers. Um, I, I, uh, Faye put the, our email address in the chat. I know Victoria also puts put hers in the chat several times as well. But the yeah, the, the ESF uh, email address, you can always send something there and then we will make sure it ends up uh, with the right speaker. Or the general info address at AMI. Yeah, what, also works. Also fine. Also <laughs> works. So there's different, different routes which you can reach us. Exactly. All right, then um, I would like to thank everyone uh, for being here. And also I would like to thank the speakers uh, a lot for the beautiful presentations. Thank you so much um, for sharing your story with us. And uh, we hope to see you again in the next AMI talk, which is on the 8th of March. Uh, and uh, we will feature Noah Sobe. He is a professor of education. Yeah, he's a professor of education. And um, we're currently looking for a, a second uh, presenter, but it is on International Women's Day, which is, of course, so appropriate for Miriam Montessori, who champ championed so many human rights. Um, so that will be, we'll be back to our usual Wednesdays for that. But of course, you know, the 6th of January this year was not obliging to fall on a Wednesday. <laughs> so thanks to everybody who um, joined us on, on a Friday. And you know, we've, we're recording these sessions. So they will be available on YouTube at a later stage, but we'll let everyone know once they've been edited and they're available. Exactly. All right. So um, 
you should now all also have the opportunity um, to unmute yourself. So if you would like to unmute yourself and say uh, hello and goodbye to everyone, uh, please go ahead. And otherwise, you can also just wave. And uh, yeah, we're looking forward to seeing you again next time. Bye. 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 Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Happy New Year, everyone.